Hey, what's up guys, it's Matt with the Movement System. In this video, we're gonna break down the framework that elite strength coaches know and understand really well to develop the right adaptations at the right time to peak performance. You may have noticed that whenever you stop training vertical jump, very quickly your vertical jump will start to decrease. And you may have also noticed that once you build muscle mass, it's fairly easy to maintain that even with a lower volume of training than it took to build that muscle mass. The reason for this is that different adaptations are either more transient or more residual. The scientific framework for understanding this is residual training effects, and that's a really important framework to understand to program for your athletes effectively and develop the right adaptations at just the right time. We're gonna evaluate this chart from the book Triphasic Training, which was written by Cal Dietz, who is a leader in this space. We're gonna talk about each one of these fitness qualities and how long they last and specifically how to structure our training with these different variables strategically so that we can peak adaptations for our athletes. So let's start off by talking about aerobic endurance training. This training adaptation lasts 30 days plus. With aerobic training, we're often doing this in a base training phase, typically off season. By doing this type of aerobic training, we develop aerobic adaptations to our oxidative energy systems. We can increase aerobic enzymes and mitochondria, capillary density, improve hemoglobin and myoglobin content, and improve the rate of fat utilization. And that leads us into max strength, which is another adaptation that we're often driving far away from competition, for example, in the off season. A big component of maximal strength is muscle hypertrophy, so that's something that we're often driving in the off season and building a base of that we can then become more specific with as we approach the season. The fact that these gains last for 30 days plus is really important for how we structure our training. It doesn't make a lot of sense to do muscle hypertrophy training 10 days or even five days or three days before a basketball game because you're gonna impair your vertical jump and it's not very specific to basketball performance. So a good training plan typically involves tapering off the amount of muscle hypertrophy that we're doing as we approach a field sport season and doing more specific work for those speed and power adaptations that are going to be important for sport performance. Now this is a good time to mention that it doesn't have to be all or nothing with these principles. You may still do one or two maximal strength exercises with, for example, lower volume as you approach the competition as part of your power speed program. But four weeks or eight weeks prior to that, you were doing 60% max strength work, for example. You're just tapering down the amount of that and you're replacing it with more of that power and speed work, which we're gonna talk about here in a second, has a smaller residual training effect and needs to be trained closer to performance. And that leads us into anaerobic glycolytic endurance, which we're typically gonna train pretty heavily in the preseason. You can think of this as your conditioning work or your work on your lactate threshold. Anaerobic conditioning training improves your ability to buffer hydrogen ions as well as improves specific anaerobic enzyme concentrations. All of these physiological adaptations improve your conditioning for being able to run up and down the court or recover between football plays or other anaerobic demands of sport. And then moving into strength endurance, you'll see that the timeline of residual adaptations is very similar. Strength endurance involves hypertrophy of the slow twitch fibers, as well as similar improvements in aerobic and anaerobic enzyme concentrations. This is an important sport quality because if you're a lineman in football, for example, you need to produce forceful, strong movements throughout the entire game and have the capacity to do that. With a well-structured program, hopefully you do some aerobic base conditioning work and accommodate to a higher volume of training, and then you can do more intense anaerobic capacity, sport-specific work as you approach the season. For the American football offensive lineman, for example, that might involve aerobic work, doing longer efforts, such as sled pushes and hill runs, and things like that that are a bit longer than an actual play lasts in the off season. And then as you move towards the preseason, you may do hill sprints that are a bit more intense, shorter duration, and more focused on things like anaerobic capacity and your ability to produce strength and force over and over again in the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter of the game. Developing this specific conditioning can be really important for this athlete to actually see good performance numbers and get that scholarship. Looping back to training mistakes, if that athlete spends too much time on speed and footwork in the off season, they might just be wasting their time on adaptations that aren't really going to show when they get to the field. That's why it's important to understand these residual training adaptations and plan your training appropriately. 
And then the last training effect that we're going to talk about is maximal speed. Maximal speed typically only lasts for around five days. This adaptation is driven by improved neuromuscular control and motor control, increased phosphocreatine storage, and anaerobic power. All of these physiological adaptations are very transient, meaning they don't last for a long period of time unless you're training them constantly. When it comes to speed work, we're going to do very short tapers for competition. An aerobic endurance athlete might do a 7-day or a 10-day taper for competition, but that would wreck performance for speed. Speed is very neuromuscularly driven, so we have to do higher frequency training and shorter tapers, for example. I've seen coaches misinterpret this residual training effect to say that, oh, because these training adaptations of max speed don't last a long time, we need to be training them year round constantly. That's probably not the best interpretation of this information because it will lead athletes to underdevelop other qualities like strength and hypertrophy and build the size they need for their sport. How much of your training should be dedicated to max speed and power type adaptations depends on the level of competition you're at and the priority of this adaptation versus other adaptations. But regardless, knowing that this is a very short residual training effect, we should be prioritizing training very close to competition when it comes to these very high neuromuscularly driven adaptations like speed. Depending on your short-term or long-term goals, you may structure blocks of training different ways. You may do hypertrophy training, then strength training, then power speed work, and then speed specific work, for example. This is more following the linear periodization model where we're building towards those speed adaptations in season when we need them the most. A different way to structure training is doing concurrent training where we're developing different adaptations, for example, with undulating periodization, but that might look completely different than the other block model. And you may be an athlete who's already well-sized for your position in your sport, but you need to specifically develop speed and power, so you're going to train those blocks more frequently throughout the year. It's important to realize that great coaches don't have special exercises that you don't have access to. Instead, they just develop the right adaptations at the right time with a good program and good training structure. If you are interested in learning more about program design for athletes and you want to learn how to write a strength program, a power and plyometric program, a hypertrophy program, and an endurance program for your athletes, go ahead and check out my course, Program Design 101. In this course, I show you exactly how I write my programs. I give you templates and assignments. And by the end of the course, you'll have a portfolio of great programs that you've written and you can immediately use for your athletes. This course also earns you NSCA CEUs towards maintaining your CSCS certification. If you want to learn more about it, the first step is clicking the link in the description below to download my five step guide to writing a strength conditioning program. I hope you guys learned a lot from the video. Smash the like button, subscribe if you want to learn more, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Thanks.